So we're happy to welcome you today to the webinar, which is entitled Promoting Diversity in the Geosciences, Meet the Geoscience Women in STEM. And I think we're probably all familiar with the Zoom tools by now, since we've been using them heavily for the last couple of months. So let's go on to the next slide, please. Actually, you can probably skip ahead. Uh, well, we'll go to the next one. So the, the uh, members of this organizing team here are myself, Aida Awad, I'm past president of NAGT, Ed Roback from the American Geosciences Institute, Peg Steffen, who's joining us as the interim NESTA executive director, and um, Andrew Havlis typically works with us at CERC and Mitch Awalt is in for him. So thank you, Mitch, for doing all the support work and the back end tech work for us. We're really happy to have you. Next slide, please. Uh, the webinar presenters today are gonna be kind of a familiar group. Um, Ed Robeck will be kind of starting us off. Then Laura Hollister is joining us. Laura is a science teacher at Pittman High School. Cheryl Manning is joining us. Cheryl's a science teacher at Evergreen High School, and I'll be uh, rounding out that group. And as well, we're joined by four of the wonderful geoscience women in STEM, Dr. J Dr. Hope Jaron, Dr. Jessica Esquival, Shiloh Ragoff, and Jasmine Sadler. We'll have time at the end for discussion and Q&A, um, and we'll also talk about the post-webinar survey. So upcoming webinars, hey, it's May and we typically take the summer off. We'll be doing that again, probably starting in September, possibly August. Announcement will be come out, coming out soon. But I'm really excited to announce today that as of a couple hours ago, the entire webinar archive is now available on the American Geosciences Institute YouTube channel as a playlist. So if you wanna catch up on any of our previous webinars, hop on YouTube, go to the American Geosciences Institute, click on playlists, and you will see all the webinars there for you. So you can watch those over the summer. So don't forget to please use your chat box. You'll find the chat box at the bottom center of your screen and type into uh, the chat box any questions or thoughts or comments that you have during the course of the webinar. We'll also be asking you uh, some prompts to help get some of that discussion out there and get some ideas flowing so we can have a discussion in the chat and a discussion on the screen. All right, let's go ahead and move forward. Perfect. Ed, I think we're turning it over to you. That's right. Hi, everyone. Really glad to have everybody here to talk about these really important questions that we'll be discussing today. As I'm talking in this first part, I'd like to invite all of you to think about the questions that we've been thinking about as we've been developing these materials with these four wonderful scientists and about their work. We know that professionals in the geosciences are actively working to enhance diversity across many fields. What strategies have you used or do you think could be used to further that effort? It's an important question in the geosciences. We know that that, that is an important question in all areas, but especially in the geosciences. Let me start off by saying that I am Ed Robeck. I am the Director of Education and Outreach at the American Geosciences Institute. And I'm pleased to be here today to address this. The materials that, are, that this team has been developing are part of the Earth Science Week initiative, which is an international celebration of the geosciences. The theme for Earth Science Week last year was Geosciences for Everyone, where we tried, worked with the community to explore the different ways that we can extend the representation of different people in the geosciences. We're really focusing on a couple of questions, and that is, how can we inspire young people to imagine themselves as potentially having a future in STEM when many of the people they see represented in those roles do not look like them or are portrayed as having different backgrounds than the young people we are working with? And I think about my own niece's picture as I, uh, as I held it up to the screen just a few minutes ago. She's a very young person, she's four years old, and she drew a male scientist. And she drew him at a workbench, and we can talk about some of those implications going forward. As I said, these questions are relevant throughout the STEM fields, but we also know that the geosciences are one of the fields that has the lowest representation of women and minorities, and so we're looking for ways to address that. We believe that one approach is to guide young people to explore the lives and work of STEM professionals who represent the diversity of the real world. Today, we're sharing some curriculum related materials that have been developed in conjunction with the If Then Initiative, which is sponsored by the Lida Hill Philanthropies to encourage that kind of exploration. 
The materials we're highlighting are curriculum connections related to the lives and work of the four STEM professionals that are with us today. If the if, the if then initiative was started by the Lida Hill Philanthropies as a way of encouraging young women and all who might have trouble seeing themselves in current images of STEM workforce to revise their image of who can be a STEM worker. The activities are intended to help students primarily in middle and high school from all backgrounds see the potential of becoming part of the geoscience and STEM workforce. The materials are available on a website. The URL is there on the screen. And that's part of AGI's Earth Science Week resources. Today, we're gonna to give each of the four scientists a chance to share a little bit about their thoughts and also the uh, elements of the curriculum design work that we've done related to their work. So at this point, I'd like to invite our first scientist, Dr. Hope Jaron. We've given, we've invited each of the scientists to say a few words here at the beginning of the webinar, um, and especially Dr. Jaron, who we're really um, happy to have, who's in Oslo, so, um, a, what, six hours, I believe, ahead of most of us. So it's a little later for her. So she'll be joining us for just a little while and then uh, signing off. So um, Dr. Jaron, please. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I'm happy to be here and see everybody. I'm in uh, Oslo, Norway, and it's uh, after 10 o'clock at night. And like a lot of women scientists, I juggle my geo career with uh, my kid and, and uh, my family, my parents and, and everything. And so I'm going to be here with you and then I'm gonna go to the second part of my juggling act and uh, get, make sure the kids are in bed and stuff. Okay, um, it's wonderful to talk to you. We're going to hear some great stories from, from the other ambassadors as well. My story, uh, how I got to geosciences, um, my father was a community college teacher. He taught at a rural community college for 42 years, 42 consecutive years. He was a wonderful teacher, a wonderful man. He taught uh, chemistry and calculus and um, physics and earth science and um, all the sciences, you know, that came his way. He also had a lab where he did um, demonstrations and the students could, um, you know, do, do the exercises that went with the class. And so just like some of the families, um, you know, the family in town that had the ice cream store, all the kids learned how to scoop ice cream. Um, my brothers and I learned how to uh, fix the materials in his lab and, and do the demonstrations and run through the exercises the night before to make sure that everything was in good working order for my dad's class the next day. So from the time I was a very little girl, I was in the lab and I thought it was the greatest place ever. He loved it there and I loved it there and it never occurred to me that these were um, difficult things or scientific things or or school things it was all they were just toys from from what i knew uh with my with my brother and my dad and and he always was really great in um, letting us to uh take all the stuff out and turn it on and play with it and fix it and, and look at it and stuff like that and so i think uh, for me um it was that 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 made me uh, a scientist and that I carried it with me through through all these years and through all these days and I'm, I there was a lot of stuff I wasn't good at you know I took classes that that were farther away from being in the lab and stuff I had to learn and had to work at and and didn't come easily but it was that feeling that uh, I could get back to the lab maybe I'd have my own lab one day and I'd have friends there and we'd have all this equipment and we'd break it and we'd fix it and, and it would be so much fun um, and so uh, I think you can't expose people to to science too young. Um, I think I think it's it's the sooner you make those good associations. Um, uh, you know, the whole reason I do science is it it makes me happy. I know we're supposed to be doing useful things and and making stronger bridges and and better medicines and things like that. But you know, at the end of it all, I do it because it gives me joy. And um, I try to share that joy and try to pass it on. And the only thing that's better than that is when you see that same joy spark 
in another person. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Jaron, very much for sharing that. The joy of science. Appreciate that very much. Um, I do want to, because um, Dr. Jaron's going to be leaving us uh, for her other tasks, as she said, uh, I wanted to invite if, are there any questions right now for Dr. Jaron before she leaves? If there are any, um, I cannot, Aida, I don't know if you saw my note, I cannot see the chat while my, I'm screen sharing. So, um, so far we have just uh, one comment from Wendy Williams. Thank you, Wendy, for um, applauding hope for bringing joy to us. And she says, interesting about the lack of outdoor settings. Oh, us right now? Well, I'm I think not, perhaps in the draw scientist test. It might have been in the draw oh. scientist. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, Hi, yeah. this is Wendy. You know how the chat threads thank together, you. right? There you go. So, yeah. Joy, <laughs> thank you so much for showing all that uh, hope. Thank you for showing all that joy. It has been a long semester. <laughs> it's not it, done yet. Ah, <laughs> uh, and there we I, can I, see I, it is still light out. Amazing. Oh, yes, it <laughs> is. We will be, um, uh, the sun won't completely go down until um, midnight or so. Hmm. Okay, wow. Long days, more time for work. <laughs> uh, it, 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 you still get tired at the end of the day. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, thanks again for being with us. And uh, just for anyone who's, who doesn't know this, um, Dr. Jaron has a, an autobiographical book about what she just described called Lab Girl. That's a, that's a wonderful read. And it's actually part of the big read of the National uh, uh, Endowment for the Humanities this year. So really glad to have, have you with us. Thanks very much. Yeah, I have another book that's just come out. It's called The Story of More. And oh. it's a book about how the last 50 years of um, uh, Earth's history and human activities have led to what we experience as climate change. So it's a, it's a, it's a book that um, folks can use to start talking about, about those issues. We had one more question that's come into the chat um, for Dr. Jiren about, I'm wondering what was maybe the biggest challenge that you faced in your career as a woman in geoscience? Easy, it's money. Um, uh, trying to keep the lab going, trying to keep body and soul together, trying to keep um, people employed. Uh, gosh, I don't know if that applies to me as a woman or whatever, but my knee jerk reaction is, you know, what's the biggest challenge you've had? Absolutely keeping things financed. Um, might have been better if I'd have been able to join the right parties and field trips and be one of the guys. Um, but uh, definitely that was that was the part that that really almost broke us many, many times was just trying to pay the bills. What advice would I give to undergrads who are starting out in geology? Um, I think with students, I think we ask them to think about what they need to learn, what they need to get better at, or what are your deficiencies, and do you need to know more math or more statistics or whatever. I always like to tell students that they should think hard about what they love. What do you love about school? What are the particular things you do you like to build things with your hands do you like it when you solve an equation and get the right answer do you like what you know what is the little moment that goes ding that the part that's fun and easy and and comes naturally think about what that is and and, and how that feels and, and where it comes from because if you if you really understand that part and cultivate it and hang on to it and remember to do it <laughs> <laughs> that will get you through the harder stuff. You know, always make sure that, that you that you really hold precious that that part that you love and and find a way to to practice it frequently and and use that as kind of a guiding star to get you where you're supposed to be. Excellent. Thank you so much. And again, thank you for being here and thank you for being part of this project and being part of STEM for all. It's a wonderful program and I'm proud to be part of it. And thanks for having me. And um, I, I think I have, I see a hand up. 
No, that was oh, my applause. applause. Oh, that's applause. Okay. That's, that's, that's applause. the reaction applause. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Thank you. Um, and we are um, referring to this page, and um, I'm just wanted, just pointing out that the way we're doing the sequence with the scientists is just clockwise around the page, starting with uh, Dr. Jaron. So our next scientist that we have with us today that is um, also one of the AAAS if then STEM ambassadors, uh, it, which is a big part of this program, is Shaila Raghav. And Shaila is vice president of climate change for Conservation International and an expert on the impact of climate change on people and nature. Thank you very much, Shaila, for being here. Thank you so much for, for having me. And I'm really thrilled to be part of uh, this project with three fellow ambassadors and so honored to be working alongside with them on developing this content for, for this initiative. Um, it's also just been so incredible to see how opportunities for women and for scientists in general have really expanded over the last few decades. I remember when I was a kid, um, being an environmentalist or being uh, was was uh, synonymous with um, drawing attention to litter and recycling. Um, and now we we can see that it's so much more. There's so much more we can do within education and science that it's really so fundamental and embedded into almost every sector of society. You will need scientists working on setting climate change targets in companies or helping us to develop smarter development or urban development plans. Um, and we can imagine so many more opportunities and possibilities for addressing global challenges like climate change. And so I currently am in a role in a nonprofit where I lead the, um, the climate change strategy for an organization that's focused on environmental conservation. And so a lot of my work really focuses on climate science and communicating climate science to different audiences. So to um, uh, policymakers in particular, but to business leaders and to the public at large to, to raise awareness for or to compel action on climate change. We know that globally emissions need to peak in 2020 and need to be approaching net zero by 2050. So we, we have our timeline over the next 30 years of where we need to go. And now it's a matter of really um, compelling that behavior change to make those emissions reductions a reality. And so I've spent a lot of my career um, being it, trying to communicate science to policymakers, and a lot of my work was at the Paris Agreement at the international level. So I spent about three years um, actively working with countries on their negotiation positions um, on on climate change, and so so I, I really I, I think you know my story has really been about rooting my career and my expertise and my perspective in sound science. Um, and in understanding that science, um, and but then being able to find ways to communicate it um, effectively given different decision contexts. Um, producing the science as a standalone product is, is really not enough. It's about synthesizing it, analyzing it, um, and, and connecting it in a way that people can really understand it and then be compelled to make those behavior changes that are really gonna allow us to confront global challenges like climate change. And I really do think that climate change is the issue of our generation. And it's, it's one that will define so many of our careers. And especially now with COVID, we're seeing um, the impacts of disruptions and how they can fundamentally change all of our lives. And I think that, that uh, climate change is no exception. This is really just a precursor and, um, and, and a warning sign, I think, of, of what, what will come if we do not prepare for what climate change will unleash in terms of in terms of impact. And so I think we really have an opportunity here in educating um, young leaders um, about is global issues like climate change and, and, and kind of, I think, cultivating a new understanding of our relationship with the planet and to, to really transition our relationship with nature and the planet of one that's defined by extraction to one of regeneration. Um, and so I'm really thrilled to be part of this project and, and, and really honored to be, to be speaking with you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ella. Very well said. It is the issue of our time, isn't it? Um, and uh, we'll, be have, we'll have some additional time for questions after, 
I don't know if anybody's watching the chat. Is there anything in particular right now to, to address? No, Ida's saying no. So, so we'll move on right now to, um, to Jasmine Sadler. Uh, Jadler, Jasmine is an entrepreneur who is CEO of the STEAM Collaborative. She's trained as an aerospace engineer and holds an MBA as, that she uses in her, in her work with, uh, educating children and their parents about STEM from an artistic perspective. And while she's not per se a geoscientist, we found lots of connections between her work, geoscience, and the role that she can play in helping to diversify the geosciences. So, Jasmine. Thank nice. you, Ed. Thank you for having me here. And thank you for every, everybody that's representing women in STEM and cares about it and is trying to grow it along with the rest of us. So a little bit about me. I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan. And the main thing I love was dancing growing up. So my parents kind of put me in everything, figure skating, basketball, softball, golf. But the main thing that stuck for me was dance. And that was what I loved my whole life. And then I think as I started to grow up, I learned that both of my parents worked as computer specialists for the government. And my brother loved playing with computers. That was never really my thing though. And so I didn't know what a computer specialist was either. <laughs> but the main thing that I recognized from my parents was that they did just like a great job of, I guess, co-parenting. Like they had the exact same job, but um, they would, my mom would be with my brother and me in the morning, make us breakfast every morning, make sure we got to school. And then when we got home, my dad would be at home, did dinner, and then make sure we did our homework. And that was pretty much how it went. So that showed me from an early age, at least that the gender roles weren't really a thing in my house, that it was more so um, just working the same job inside the house and literally the same job outside of the house. And so that that's really what I had to look at as my models growing up were my parents. And then from there, they would put me in some of the local engineering programs just to learn some of those skills or create a website. And those are things that were just done on Saturdays. Um, also, it increased our ACT, SAT scores. So we have classes like that. Um, so that's kind of where I got my exposure to some things about STEM. But then from there, it would be summer programs. So I went on the campus of a university in 11th grade for the summer, and then 12th grade, another summer, another university. And so that was really a program to expose me to different types of engineering, because I had heard about engineering, but didn't really know what it meant. And then being exposed to what a material science does, which is like, they showed us a baseball bat example. So the bat material is important. And then we went to the aerospace engineering lab and it talks about rockets and propulsion and things like that and bombs because that's all from combustible type things. Um, it talks about civil engineers and those are ones that make things that don't move. So bridges and uh, freeways and things like that. And then even mechanical engineers that make things that move. So like cars and trains. So that's where I just got exposure to the different types of engineering. And my brother actually pursued computer engineering and really encouraged me to pursue some type of engineering as well because he mentioned that, you know, it's a lucrative career. It's right on track for people who love math and science. And then it's a professional degree once you graduate. So you don't have to go back and get a master's or a PhD if you don't really want to. That uh, engineers, people consider them professional. They know exactly what they're doing when it's related to math, science, and engineering. And then, of course, technology now with, with STEM. So from there, it was right around high school where I had to decide what do I want to major in in college. And then the Space Shuttle Columbia disaster happened. So for me, and for a lot of other women in this space, we get into STEM because we figure out that that's how we can really solve problems. And that's how we can either help our community or help our families. Or like for me, it was, I wanna save people's lives. Like they shouldn't be doing, you know, something that's the coolest job 
in the world or out of this world and still having to put their lives at stake. So that's why I decided to major in aerospace engineering in college. But all the way through college, I'm still dancing. Um, and for me, that balance, I, I think, was really the only way that I, I actually graduated in it. So I was on a hip hop dance team. I studied abroad in Hong Kong. We actually formed a dance team in Hong Kong. So a lot of that was just uh, diversifying my background and education and just my experiences. And so that's what I really strive to do with my company, the Student Collaborative Now, is exposing girls and people of color to STEM from an artistic perspective because that's how we get more innovative solutions and that's how we start more innovative companies and grow in entrepreneurship and solve a lot of the problems that the world is facing and so even with the times that we're in now the the fields that are still growing are the stem fields especially technology is on the rise right now everybody's using zoom and so having girls understand that as they're growing up that zoom is technology you know, the thing that helped you learn online, and even when your schools were closed, and the thing that helped you see your friends, even when schools were closed, was all about STEM. You know, it's all about technology. So just really putting those, that perspective into a lot of students' minds, that's, that's what I try to do. Um, and so I'm just grateful for the opportunity to be able to do it. Um, and then what I try to tell a lot of students that are in college, my mentees now, that you know, if I would have never graduated in aerospace engineering, then I couldn't tell you that you could either. So once you start and once girls are really just, you know, starting on that path, keep encouraging them to, to go through and, and complete it. Great. Thank you so much for that encouraging message. That's wonderful. And it's interesting to see how the different strands of your life did weave together to get you where you are now and to uh, spark the work that you're doing with children and families, young people. Uh, thanks very much, and, and I'm going to turn now to uh, Jessica Esquivel, who is a postdoctoral research associate at Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, or Fermilab, uh, and she's researching the electron's heavier sibling, the muon, and she brings a, yet another perspective to us about the questions of diversifying STEM. Hi, so, everybody. Jessica? <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, so my background is a little bit different. Uh, I come from a family of nurses. Uh, almost everybody in my family is in the medical profession um, on the front lines right now. Uh, and at a really young age, my mom had a list of occupations that she wanted her daughters to be. And obviously nurse was at the top of the list. Um, but I remember maybe I was in middle school and my mom got um, a splinter in her finger and she asked me to go get the tweezers to help her get it out. Oh, I got so clammy. There wasn't even any blood, but I was freaked out. I couldn't do it. I almost threw up. And at that point, my mom realized, okay, this is not going to be <laughs> the profession that my daughter goes into. So I really didn't have people around me to show me, you know, what math and science was, what STEM was. Um, and I think that's why I really prescribe to the if then ambassadorship and the importance of representation, because it was watching TV with my aunt. Um, my mom raised me, we were a single parent household. So I spent a lot of time with my aunt as she babysat us. Um, and we were hooked on the sci-fi channel. All of those really cheesy, you know, low budget films, <laughs> that was my jam. Um, and in one of those, there was some astronaut in space fighting aliens. Uh, the spaceship was, you know, blowing up and there was an astrophysicist at NASA that was telling the astronaut in space to go left and go right and press this button and put the, you know, the screwdriver here to crank shaft, you know, throwing all of these science terms out. And in my head, that astrophysicist was the hero of the story. He's the one that saved Earth. And that's who I wanted to be when I grew up. So at a really young age, I started saying I wanted to be an astrophysicist. Um, and I had 
an amazing, I think, support system from my family and all of my aunts. I uh, was filled with strong women, surrounded by strong women. And they encouraged that. Uh, and I'm from Texas, so you know, NASA's in our backyard. Uh, and they took me to NASA and they showed me what astrophysicists did. And even though when I saw them, I got bored because there was no you know, astronaut on the screen fighting aliens, it was still the push that I needed to continue to be in STEM and to continue to foster you know, that interest that I had. So while I wasn't surrounded by you know, family that loved math and science, my mom actually hates math. <laughs> Um, the fact that they didn't shy away or shun from exposing me to STEM, um, whether it be in media or to, you know, field trips like going to NASA or enrolling me into, you know, science and engineering courses when I was, um, like summer camps when I was young, they did all of that to make sure that I still, um, kept that interest. Um, and I think I follow a little bit from my mom. Math is not my favorite subject either, <laughs> but you, you know, you need tools to do the physics that I do. And I see math as a tool. So I don't have, you know, a favorite screwdriver, but I use screwdrivers all the time in, in my work. That, that's how I see, you know, math. Um, but yeah, I, I, I work at Fermilab which is a Department of Energy National Laboratory. Um, I'm studying the bleeding edge of our scientific knowledge. Um, I am answering questions that I thought I would never be able to answer. Um, and the fact that I'm in the room, being a Black woman, I'm forging paths to make and to have more people that look like me in the room as well. And I think if it weren't for that bit of, you know, being able to increase diversity in my field, I don't know if I would have still been here. <laughs> um, to me, those go really hand in hand. So my passion not only is for physics, but it's also to increase, you know, representation in, in in physics, so yeah. Well, we're really glad you are here with us. Thank you very much for that message. And the thing that excites me about this is just the diversity of paths that have brought each of you to your fields, the diversity of ways that you're, that you're working in STEM, and just the diversity of backgrounds that you show as just by who you are can be part of STEM and this initiative. So we appreciate that very much. Thank you for this. And what we're going to do now is start to look at um, some of the things that have been developed around the work that you all have done. Just wanted to check really quickly. Cheryl, was, um, was there anything that you wanted to address from the chat really quickly before we move? Um, yeah, so there's a couple of questions that came up. Um, let me just scroll up here. Give me a second. Um, so, one question for all of uh, the ambassadors is the idea of of the obstacles faced. What are the biggest obstacles faced in your career to get where you're uh, where you are today, and um, how did you overcome those? Jessica, why don't we start with you? We'll just kind of go backwards. Okay, sounds good. Um, definitely the lack of representation. Uh, I these spaces weren't built for me, <laughs> right? Um, so the fact that I was in these rooms shook a lot of people. Um, so being able to stay confident in the fact that I do belong in that space, that I do belong in that room, um, while, you know, fighting microaggressions left and right, <laughs> being and continuing to stay confident in, in yourself, I think was the, was the hardest part. Um, in undergraduate, uh, I went to a predominantly Hispanic uh, university, Hispanic serving institution, and I am Afro Latinx. So I felt comfortable in that space because people look like me. Um, but I was still one of only in my science and engineering classes. Um, so 
I think I, I didn't feel those microaggressions as strongly because I had a sense of community at that university. And it wasn't until graduate school where I was the only that it really took its toll. On top of the fact that physics is already super hard, <laughs> dealing with that added layer really did shake my confidence. Um, and having mentors in my corner and people that cared about my path to and through, um, it was important to have. I don't think I could have made it. I wouldn't have made it if it weren't for mentors and sponsors that I that were in my that were in my corner. Very good. Thank you. And that's a great segue to Jasmine. So I know that's a passion of yours. Yeah, some things that I experienced, um, just even climbing the corporate ladder. So um, definitely the glass ceiling, I hit it and tried to break through it and kept hitting it and kept hitting it. So, um, so then I left is what it came down to. And so, you know, it's a statistic out there that, you know, most women after 10 years in, in engineering, they leave. Um, and I hit right at the 10 year mark and it, it just gets to a point where, you know, I know I have enough credentials, you know, I have my MBA, I have a bachelor's in engineering, I have my own company. And when I'm trying to be, you know, apply for management roles at my job and you're telling me I don't have management experience, um, you know, or, or just things like that. But then you don't give me that opportunity at work to even show some of that. So that that's really the, the hardest thing that I that I experienced and like kept trying to force it um, when I knew that that really wasn't this that wasn't my fight to fight um, from the inside. And so for me, it was I mean, my background is in quality engineering at work um, and working in the aerospace and energy fields. And so it's all about like finding the root cause of the issue. What's the root cause of this? And I have a Six Sigma black belt, you know, all of that stuff. And it's all about the root cause. And for me, the root cause wasn't that, um, that, that I didn't feel welcome. The root cause wasn't that there aren't a lot of women here. It was more so that when they're younger, you don't even know to get these people in here. And so, you know, one of the symptoms of that is that there's nobody that looks like me here. And the symptoms of that is that they don't understand even just different cultures and different backgrounds in a lot of ways. And so, um, so then that's why my fight to fight is getting women to have this identity of like, yes, I can be an engineer or I, I'm already an engineer or yes, I'm a manager, you know, I'm managing my home, I'm managing my kids and things like that. So that it's, it's not a weird concept when somebody tries to tell you, you don't have any management experience, you don't have enough, you know, degrees or, or anything like that, that you know that you can, and maybe that's just not your fight to fight, and that there's a space outside of that. There's tons of spaces that you can create outside of that to, to be able to, to follow through with what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, thanks so much. It, um, in in my case, I think I've I've struggled with feeling um, undervalued or dismissed or disregarded, and it's in particularly very male dominated spaces. So I, I alluded to the fact that I've done a lot of work internationally at the United Nations, and most of these negotiation rooms are filled with with men, quite senior men that are in positions of power, and um, I've struggled with being taken seriously. But on the flip side, I also feel sometimes tokenized or that I would get selected or placed in spaces just for um, checking that box that they've included a woman of color, they've included a, you know, a quote unquote young person to be part of those dialogues. And so, you know, I, I struggled with my confidence on a couple different fronts, one feeling like I wasn't being heard, but on the other hand, I am kind of being heard, but not necessarily in a genuine um, way that was was really respecting my voice and my perspective, and so I've learned to 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 be able to ask for help in in some cases, and um, I, I've been fortunate to also have mentors and 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 be able to um, um, use their support as needed. So so an example is our CEO has once uh, has from the time taken me to meetings and then deferred to me 
and said, our expert on this topic is Shaila. She will speak on behalf of our organization. And, and to have someone in a position of power do that for you helps legitimize you, but also helps give me the, the self-confidence. So I think just not being afraid to ask for help, to, to stand on my, on my merits and my laurels, um, but at the same time, recognize the humility that, that you also need to have in recognizing that we also need need to be um, um, given those opportunities and be and, and others have a responsibility to us as well. Thank you. Thanks very much to all, to all of you for sharing that. And um, really what we're doing with these materials is starting to think about ways that we can broaden this conversation and bring young people into this conversation so that they can shape identities much like you have. And I'm going to turn it over now to Laura Hollister, who's going to start to share some of the ways that we've identified to, to extend that conversation to young people. Thanks, Ed. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'll be sharing a little bit about lesson one with you. Students often arrive in class with preconceived ideas about who scientists and engineers are and what they do. To engage students and challenge stereotypes about STEM professionals, we have included some activities designed to help them think deeply about who can be a scientist and what work scientists do. One of these activities, which is a classic, is often referred to as draw a scientist test or DAST. In the activity, students are asked to draw a scientist doing their work. So think about that for a minute. What would you draw if you were asked to draw a scientist doing their work? Would it be a more stereotypical vision of a scientist, or perhaps a scientist working in the field, or in a national accelerator lab surrounded by an international team of researchers? Whatever the picture, the Draw a Scientist activity opens the door for students to enter the STEM world as they explore the journeys and work of four amazing STEM professionals. Another set of activities designed to help students see their own relationship to STEM is the development of some timelines. In every interview, each scientist shared formative moments in their lives that shaped how they viewed STEM and how they viewed their own place in the STEM community. After reading the stories about each of the women, Students will create a timeline that includes key moments in the life of the scientist, producing a visual pathway of the professional's journey from student to STEM community member. Once they've completed their scientist timeline, students are invited to create a timeline of events in their own lives, including their interests and key moments that may have nurtured or helped them develop their interests. Students are then asked to consider their own future and include possible future endeavors tied to their interests what new interests they may develop and how STEM may play a role in their future. By reflecting on their own lives and connections to STEM, students' perceptions of their relationship to STEM may shift, allowing them to see themselves as members of the STEM community and connect with the value STEM provides in their lives. Finally, students are asked to look at an array of images and consider if they are places that STEM professionals might work. Students are asked to think about what work might take place in each location, what questions they have about each location, and how they might feel working in that location. By considering the variety of places that STEM professionals work, students' ideas of STEM may shift and grow. And that's it for lesson one. I'm going to pass the mic over to Aida to tell you about lesson two. Aida? Great. Thanks so much, Laura. Um, I'm going to ask first that if you would, while we're going through kind of lesson two materials here, you can type some ideas into the chat box. And those ideas should be around this kind of a prompt. How can we help students connect STEM classroom learning to real world STEM work? Give that a little bit of thought as I show you around some of the lesson two materials. So for each of the women in STEM, the second set of lessons builds on two areas of focus. They are to highlight active learning investigations that are foundational to the work of each of the women and to build connections between those activities and the work of the women in STEM and geosciences. So let's take a look at each of the sets of activities. Um, we're going to start out with Dr. Jiren's work. Um, Dr. Jiren's most exciting work as a scientist often begins and ends with the common tree. The activities in this lesson encourage students to de delve into the scientific world, discovering for themselves some of what we can learn from things like tree rings, atmospheric conditions, 
and climate data from around the globe. The first activity, students explore Dr. Jiren's love of trees as they work with a tree ring simulator, analyze tree ring data, and create a model to demonstrate what they've learned about paleoclimates. In the next activity, students analyze climate data from sites around the world to understand how climates are defined. And then students connect climates and biomes using satellite imagery. And students examine NASA data and read an article about current changing climates and rates for photosynthesis. And finally, students design and conduct an experiment where they investigate various plant stressors. So you can see all of those activities on the page there, and you'll uh, explore those when you jump into the website later. So then we'll move on to Shyla Ragoff's work. Shyla describes climate change as the new normal. Her work provides supporting evidence demonstrating the impacts of changing climate on all geographic regions. And the activities in this lesson focus students on developing a broad-based understanding of the wide variety of impacts climate change is having across different types of environments and ecosystems. In the first lesson here, students explore changes in ocean pH and the impacts of ocean acidification. There we go. Then in activity two, we build on the understanding of changing ocean pH impacts when we look at the calcification of shells. Activity three helps students wrestle with the question of, is spring early this year? And then activity four looks at how climate impacts agriculture. Finally, activity five guides students towards thinking about how people in the community can prepare and minimize impacts of natural hazards. And yes, you're seeing the picture right in activity for everybody laugh. It was one of my, my male students' favorite pictures. <laughs> Next up is uh, Jess, Jasmine Sadler. So if you want to flip over to Jasmine's page, Ed. Great, thank you. Jasmine was also often faced with solving problems related to engineering and quality. And one of the major challenges in aerospace engineering is to turn air into energy in such a way as to meet the high quality standards necessary in the field. In the first activity here, students explore the use of design thinking as an approach to challenges involving harnessing the power of wind to produce electricity. In the next activities, students design and prototype wind turbine models, test them, calculate parameters to scale them up to full sky size, and make recommendations for siting them. And then finally, they're faced with the challenge of building the designs of their peers. Then let's jump on to Jessica's work. Jessica tells us that her work takes her to the bleeding edge of the known universe. In the lessons in this section, students are encouraged to explore basic principles of science that approach the edge of the known universe. And in these activities, students experience space in several different forms. First, as they try to see things that cannot be seen, and later as they can consider communicating across the vastness of space, finally considering the space within a single atom. Okay, well that was a look around the lesson two activities and I'm going to go ahead and um, turn it over to Cheryl in a minute, but uh, Laura, were there any things that came up in the chat that we want to focus in on for a second? Um, so there were a couple of interesting things. People were responding to the DAST activity from earlier. Um, it sounds like um, an activity that many people have participated in and used in a variety of ways. Um, and so it seems like that's something that connected with people and that everyone's had positive results with. Um, and that's it for the moment. Great. I'll turn it over to Cheryl. Helps to unmute. Our lesson three uh, focuses on local connections of the scientists' work and we want to focus on this question, what might help students see the relevance of STEM classes to their possible futures? Thanks, Aida, and everyone else for being here. Um, for each of the STEM professionals, we've designed lesson three to demonstrate strong connections between the science and the student. Hope Jaren's work on carbon cycling highlights systems thinking, and lesson three engages students learning about the carbon cycle through both game playing and place-based observations and analysis of their school's campus.
Students create visual models that identify carbon sources and sinks. They categorize these as geosphere, hydrosphere, atmosphere, or biosphere. And in their models, they demonstrate their understanding of biogeochemical processes that move carbon between these reservoirs. Then, reflecting on their own timeline, students explore how their thinking has changed about their role in the carbon cycle and the context of STEM. Moving next to uh, Shaila Raghav's work, uh, who also has been working on climate change and bringing that closer to home. Global climate change is a relevant concern to students in all parts of the world, uh, and it's become more and more so uh, in the recent years. In this lesson three, students learn about current and predicted impacts of climate change, where they live, and then compare those to the changes happening in other places. Once they have an understanding of how climate change is affecting them, they add related climate events to their own timeline, the timeline that they created much earlier, and consider the relationships between those events and themselves, their community, and to STEM, especially how STEM expertise and climate change relates to decision-making, communication, and good citizenship. Moving now to the lesson three that, uh, that we compiled for Jasmine Sadler's work. Jasmine has leveraged her experience in the arts and STEM, and adding the arts to STEM makes it STEAM, which is really hot these days, get it? Uh, Jasmine it helps to build better communities by creating networks of STEAM professionals, educators, enthusiasts, and innovators. Jasmine's lesson three encourages students to think about and create a map of their own network so they can see how they're connected to others, learn how to build the, on those connections to expand their network, and how they can leverage their networks to create a better world through STEM fields. All right, and finally, uh, looking at Jessica Esquivel's work in particle physics. Uh, this work grew from a love of mathematics, well, maybe not so much of a love, but um, an appreciation for mathematics and science fiction. Jessica's lesson three engages students in the creative endeavor of writing their own science fiction story. Students embed science facts and ideas into a fictional tale captured in storyboard format. Revisiting their own timeline, they reflect on the power of imagination, storytelling, and creativity in their own lives and in the bigger world of STEM. And that's it on each of the women's STEM lesson three. We are now going to open this up to questions and discussions. Please use the chat box to post those. Um, Aida, are there any uh, anything already posted in the chat? Yeah, a, a couple of really interesting points on our last question about connecting um, the relevance of STEM classes to possible future. Um, one of them that I really liked was a recognition that students don't sometimes don't realize that science is a real job, <laughs> um, but it's it's just something that we do in school. And exposing them to real scientists, real career scientists is, is huge. And then another comment about bringing in scientists to do presentations, even if it's remotely via Zoom um, or, or Google Hangouts or whatever it might be is such a great approach. So I wanted to bring forward those two ideas. And then we're gonna um, ask Mitchell, you've been watching the chat for us all along. Do you have some questions that you think we should be addressing, Mitchell? Yeah, so I wanted to bring up one question for all of our ambassadors uh, from earlier on in the webinar um, that mentioned that some of the ambassadors had kind of formative early experiences because of either par parents interested in science uh, or something similar. Um, and, and how can we as either educators in K-12 or undergraduate education uh, provide these early science opportunities uh, to students who might not have um, those, those uh, science, early science supports? Yeah, I can start off. Um, yeah, I, I messaged that person privately, but basically what I said in there was um, that for all of our stories, it pretty much seemed like there was some kind of connection, no matter how remote or how small, like Jessica's was her character on the show, or, you know, mine was, 
the space shuttle or trying to like save the life of the person on the space shuttle, but still being connected to like design and dance. And so, especially since you all as teachers know your students pretty personally, that find that one point of connection to STEM and exploit it basically, <laughs> you know, just make sure that, um, you know, encourage it. And so one of my students that I tutor in math right now, she wants to be a, a interior designer. And so we're working on geometry and finding out the area of squares and rectangles and things like that. And I said, okay, well, if you look at your couch that's over there, you know, let's say the couch was this wide and this long. And so now we want to add, you know, your mom wants to add a new rug in the middle of the floor and move a couple of things around. And so we want to keep your couch the same area, but now we can only fit it in half of that size. And so I'm like, these are the kind of story problems that you get on your homework that kind of scare her away because it's a story problem. But I'm like, that's, that's actually how you'll be posed with things when you're an interior designer. You know, someone will say, yeah, I really love this room, but it's going to stay the same area. And so now we have to fit other things inside of this area. So that's why math will be important. And that's why the stuff you're learning right now will be important. So um, yeah, just really think about those small points of connection. But I think a lot of it comes where you also need to know some of those connections. So then you can make those connections for your students. So like I mentioned earlier, like Zoom is technology. So now that you know that and kind of think about it and so now you can start posing questions to your students like anytime you run into an issue while you're teaching them online you can start to say okay who knows how to solve this problem <laughs> see you just did engineering right there you solved this problem using technology you know so some things like that i totally agree with everything that jasmine said um and coming from you know a physics background like physics is literally everywhere right I mean, right now, TikTok is huge because of COVID, right? <laughs> Talking about how your TikTok videos would be better if you understood sound, you know, and how sound bounces off the walls and how you can use some sort of muffler to dampen out the sound. That's, that's physics, right? Um, anytime I have uh, students that I'm tutoring, uh, especially when we start getting into like centripetal force or, you know, electricity and magnetism, I always, always, always bring it back to the work that I'm doing at the lab. And I show them these awesome sci-fi photos and I show them data that I'm working on in the lab to show them. I know it seems like super lame that we're just looking at a rope and a bucket with water going around in a circle, but this is literally the same, you know, type of uh, equations and math that we're doing to solve and to understand the biggest questions in physics right now. So I feel like putting it into perspective and showing them, you know, these really abstract concepts that seem super lame and super boring are actually being used by physicists to understand the universe really does help to hold on to something so and then I would also add um, uh, we talked about how uh, students have never seen scientists or don't understand that it could be a career um, I would also say that parents don't understand that that could also be a career too when I wanted to go get my graduate degree in physics my mom said I'm not going to pay for you to become a professional student. Like you need to get a job. <laughs> so, I mean, I went through that where people didn't understand, well, my family didn't understand that a physicist is a career. Um, so I think when we talk about like science communication, it's not only, and it shouldn't only be directed to students and children, it should also be directed to adults and showing them that STEM is everywhere. And it can be a lucrative business. <laughs> I think what Jasmine and Jessica said was beautiful and I think covered all of m much of my sentiment as well. I think for me going out in nature and just firsthand experiencing nature and its beauty and um, and even just concepts like biomimicry about how design can can mimic the um, the creations of nature to be more effective um, about how so so many of our pharmaceuticals have actually come from 
um, compounds or chemicals in rainforests. And I think things like that have just sparked my imagination and, and, and inspired with, within me an understanding of, of our natural world and, and uh, all around us. So I think just, just simple activities like that have had a, had a huge impression on me as well. Thanks for sharing those wonderful responses. Uh, so I'm going to jump in just for one yeah. really quick second here, um, just to be sensitive to time. We're happy to stay and, and go through some more questions and hope that others will do that as well. But Ed, can I ask you to just put up the post-webinar survey in case somebody does have to, to bounce out here? I want to be sure that you have an opportunity to um, provide some feedback and also to get the certificate of participation if you need that. So um, we'll go ahead with questions, but I just wanted to make sure that that link was up for people to see as we're going through the remainder of the questions. Thanks very much. Go ahead, Mitchell. I've also added a link to the webinar survey in the chat, uh, so you can access it there as well. Um, another question for uh, the whole group of our, uh, the whole group. Um, some You've mentioned that mentors have played an important role in a lot of your journeys. Uh, and the question is, if you haven't already said so, what role have mentors played? And what advice would you give to scientists who want to be good mentors, uh, especially for underrepresented individuals? Okay, I'm going to talk. Um, I think I've talked heavily on how I wouldn't be here if it weren't for mentors. And I actually like to um, clarify the difference between mentors and sponsors. Um, I think both are super important in your you know, path to and through uh, your career. Um, mentors are you know people that talk to you and help you with your homework and tell you which classes that you need to take um but sponsors stick their neck out for you right and 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 um we've heard of people in power uh elevating you and 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 allowing you to show your expertise to me that's that's what sponsors are um and if you can be that for a student, I, I, I think that that would be very, you know, powerful to, to their progress um, in, in STEM. Um, yeah, I, I think that's, that's all I wanted to, to say about that. Yeah, I had commented a little bit on how mentorship was so important in my journey as well. And I think for aspiring mentors, I think taking underrepresented individuals into spaces that they're normally not invited is, is so important because that, that will help familiarize um, um, young aspiring scientists to feel like they have that legitimacy to be in those spaces, to, to build their own confidence. Um, I think also over the years, I mean, as a mentee, I've also uh, a piece of advice I would have is just to continue being in touch, to to use any opportunity to reach out to people that have played a, a part in your life, uh, and to continue to have those touch points to update them on your accomplishments and keep them in your network and keep building your network. I think oftentimes we get caught up in life and 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 sometimes lose sight of that. So I think just maintaining a thriving active network is so important to continue to cultivate those relationships in the long run. Um, so that's what that would be my advice on the mentee side. And for me, this question is usually pretty difficult because I don't feel like I had too many mentors or like people that I could um, look at that that I can say I know this person did it before me. And so for me it would be just like this imaginary person <laughs> in my mind that I'm like, man, this person has done this. Like other people have graduated in aerospace before and other people were black and graduated in aerospace. And other people were black women that graduated, but I didn't know any of them. <laughs> it was just this, like somebody has had to do this before. And so I'm going to do it. Um, but that's why I try to be that for a lot of the the mentees that are growing up after me and like I said before like that's what that was probably the reason that really pushed me through with graduating was so that I could be that one face that people can actually say she's a rocket scientist so I know I can do it too um, but then interesting that you bring that up is because part of the if then ambassadorship is a grant 
or each of the 125 ambassadors where we get to work on a project that keeps doing what we do. Basically, they're giving us funding to do what we do best. And so one of the other ambassadors and I are actually creating this mentor program for girls and for African American students um, to keep in touch with them. That's really what it's all about is to be their mentors as they grow older. And so um, we've been approached lately because we're kind of mid-career where, um, you know, we'll go out and present and students in college want us to be their mentors or even I have a high school student in Nigeria who asked me to be her mentor. And then even we're going to elementary schools and the teachers are saying like, how can this student keep in touch with you? And so we're actually creating some type of website technology app that'll actually keep in contact with them and then give them an opening to keep in contact with us because we know having a mentor is kind of intimidating being the mentee like that that mentor is really really busy and i'm just little old me and so we we don't feel like that but that's the the perception so we're doing things it'll have a regular touch point with our mentees so that they can be open to communicating with us so be on the lookout for that as part of our ambassadorship actually Thank you so much, everybody, for that. I think we're going to go ahead and, and wrap things up. Um, so if we could, um, Ed, go ahead to the, let's see, two more slides up. We'll, we'll talk about our sponsoring organizations really quickly. So um, NAGT is one of the three sponsoring organizations of this webinar series and the uh, NGSS ESS Working Group. And NAGT actually has an entire series of webinars that are shown across the bottom. So please visit the NAGT pages. They're open and freely available for you to take a look at. And I invite you to join other webinars as they come up. Next slide, please. Peg Stefan, if you're still on, would you like to speak to the Nesta slide? Yeah, just very quickly, because I know everybody is short on time, but I was really impressed with, uh, with the speakers today. And Nesta is an organization that's been around for almost 40 years and very interested in the K-12 uh, education realm and I think the content of this webinar speaks very well uh, to us increasing our efforts in the K-5 especially and helping kids see that there's a room for for them in STEM and to provide more mentoring um, or uh, you know opportunities for the students uh, to investigate their local surroundings wherever that might be so um, we are a, an organization that is very interested in supporting teachers in their work and uh, we have an active website and uh, the earth scientist is a publication that comes out several times a year and we have a, a monthly newsletter electronic newsletter if you're not already familiar with that then please go to our website and uh, sign up we'd love to have you join us thank you and again i'm ed roback and uh, part of the sponsoring organizations is the center for geoscience and society which is part of the american geosciences institute we're a federation of professional societies and we do a number of uh, we play a number of roles for those professional societies and one of which is addressing issues that are, that uh, are important across the geoscience community one of which is the issue of diversity so we're glad to be able to take this uh, issue and do some work with it and work with you all and thank you very much for being here and we're glad to have you. I'm going to go ahead and, and wrap things up um, at this point. We're, we're well beyond our hour time. I know there were a couple of additional questions that were out there in the chat so we'll try to get uh, some discussion going via email and other avenues around those questions but Thanks very much for joining us and we hope that you will visit the new American Geosciences Institute YouTube channel and check out all of the webinars. I think there are 35 or something of them up there. So that'll give you lots to watch over the summer. And then please do watch for registration announcements for our webinars upcoming in the fall, either uh, in August or in September. So thanks to everyone for joining us this afternoon. Really appreciate it. I hope you all stay well and stay safe and have a great afternoon. Thanks again all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody.